very good morning. This is Media Monitor. I'm your host, Alicia Jali. We are live right here on the SABC 24-hour news channel. Let's look at our topics today. Let's see. The midterm budget speech is going to be one of our topics that we discuss today. And of course, Minister Nene received much appraisal about his midterm budget speech. We're going to look at the COSATU CEC meeting. And of course, we're hoping to be joined by the president right here in studio to tell us the bit of the outcomes on that CEC meeting. Of course, we're also going to cover the post office strike and see what has been done in terms of bringing the strike closer to the people. And lastly, we bring you more on the Ebola outbreak. In other news now, South Africa mourns the loss of one of its greatest athletes, Mbulayeni Mulawudzi, who died in a car accident on a regional road in Pumalanga in the early hours of Friday. We send our condolences to the family. In Botswana, the ruling Botswana Democratic Party has now won the general elections with at least 33 of the 57 parliamentary seats. And our new feature on the show today, this is the topic of the day. What are the effects of the three-month-long post office strike? Do share your views concerning this topic by calling us on the following numbers. It's plus 2711, 7146843, 7146847, and 7146857. Or interact with us on our Twitter account, that's SA Media monitor and of course our facebook page media monitor including our email address media monitor at sabc.co.za very good morning to you All right, let's welcome our guests this morning. We have with us the chairperson of SANEF and editor of the Soweto newspaper, Mr. Mpumele Lomkabela. We're also proud to be joined by our very own business news editor, Ms. Tandega Kobulu. Let's look at what is making news headlines today. Very good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, good morning, Alicia. All right, now let's start off with our headlines today. Mpumele the city press is leading with, of course, Zuma throws a royal tantrum. Now, if just to, to, to brief our viewers, this story, uh, Zuma has cancelled a very high-level uh, trip to Britain after, of course, Britain refused to grant him uh, an official audience with the Prime Minister, Mr Tony Blair. What are your views on this coverage, Mpumele? It's interesting. Um, it, uh, part of that story also appears in the Sunday Times, although they're not leading with it. And the common thread on both stories um, is that um, the... Uh, British Prime Minister uh, David Cameron refused to grant the President uh, uh, Jacob Zuma mm -hmm. uh, audience and therefore the President felt like you know there's no need for him to go to the UK for the um, for, for the, the BRICS, BRICS uh, uh, um, summit, uh, the summit. Yes. Uh, no, it's not a summit actually it's it's, it's um, it, you know BRICS uh, uh, meeting is one of those meetings where the BRICS countries uh, they go there to showcase their own countries to showcase the investment opportunities mm -hmm. and to network with the international uh, investors. So it was one of those opportunities that Mr. Zuma would have used uh, to showcase South Africa, uh, um, uh, South Africa as, a, as an investment destination um, of North Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate that uh, he, he couldn't make it, but as you can understand, if he wanted to meet the head of state in the UK um, and then they grant him the deputy prime minister, I mean surely he probably felt like that was uh, some kind of a a diplomatic, uh, uh, you, you know, demotion on, 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 on the part. And of course, him representing the whole country, South Africa, I felt like South Africa's stature in international community would be undermined by uh, Britain giving him a junior official mm -hmm. to meet with. Whereas, probably, David Cameroon would have had all kinds of people to meet there who are high profile, other presidents. I mean, we don't know for sure, but I'm sure he would, in that kind of occasion, meet other heads of states from other countries. So the question would have been, in Zuma's mind, why can't he meet me as a leader of South Africa? Mm -hmm. But that's what we are told, the, 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 that's what the, the, the stories are saying. But there may be more to that. Um, as Zuma, we know, has cancelled other high profiles visits before, uh, internationally and locally. And whenever, wh when that happened locally, we know it was as, as a result of his health. Um, he has also undertaken other trips before when people thought he, he would have done them differently. For example, when he went to, to Russia, leaving behind high-profile ministers and went there with a junior team. So, you know, uh, it might not be part of the whole story, but that's what, at least for now, the papers are reporting, that he felt like he was being undermined. Mm, but is, is it a good move in terms of business? Uh, Tandegi you just recently mentioned that South Africa is open for business. If indeed it is a um, snub from the British governor, government, 
then one would have to wonder about the state of our relations, um, the relations between the two countries. As you know, we've had um, very good um, relations until this apparent um, incident, and um, um, historically very good business relations as well. Mm, mm. All right, let's move on to our next headline, of course. Now, that's the Sunday Independent. Very, very interesting uh, headline here. Pierre, here's the proof. Now, of course, uh, this story, uh, Ria and the entire SAPS leadership are now all being probed in relation to the appointments, the disciplinary action that was taken, and, of course, uh, all the suspensions that took place. And, of course, Mr. Natin Tlego has now established a special committee, and uh, it, it's also going to look into... Uh, uh, Mr. Richard Mzuli's case. What are your views about this one, Mpumelelo? What are we going to see in terms of media coverage? Well, it's interesting in the sense that, I mean, uh, Commissioner or General Ria Pieha never actually settled on the job properly. I mean, ever since he was a, she was appointed, first people questioned her credentials, and the big story was about she's not a cop, what does she know about policing, the other most senior people deserving for the job. Then the story moved from there to what, okay, fine, let she be given a chance and let's see what she can do. Mm -hmm. She has got a business background, perhaps in business re-engineering. She can help at the corporate level, organize the police force. Mm -hmm. We had people like that before as head of the police. Uh, and then she started doing her job. She started restructuring uh, the head office, you know, getting rid of some people, employing others. Um, and then she got entangled in that process, in a fight uh, uh, between her office and the crime intelligence, one of the key pillars of crime fighting in this country, which has been under severe political tension for some time. Mm -hmm. And I think it seems as if that became, the, it was like the beginning of her troubles, uh, um, uh, aside the fact that people were questioning her, her qualifications uh, for the job. And I think that opened the door for her to be, to be probed. But what is interesting here, is that she's not being probed by the board of inquiry, the, the, the board that the president um, would normally institute, like say in the case of uh, Commissioner Peggy Taylor when he was found to have acted irregularly in the case of the lease deal. But this is a, a, a reference group, according to this story, mm -hmm. set up by the police minister um, to probe a variety of matters. So if at yes. all she's being probed, it's, it's a very indirect probe because if the probe uh, is the kind of probe that can result in her being dismissed, it has to be a board of inquiry established by the president. But in this case, it's a reference group established by the police minister, mm. which I find interesting. So there's more that, that can follow there. Um, and certainly if this reference group finds something meaty that can challenge her position or that could lead to her being questioned further, I'm sure they can refer it to the, board of, to the president to establish a board of inquiry. Mm -hmm. But that's a more serious nature kind of a probe. At this stage, it's not clear where this whole thing is going. So mm. it's going to be an interesting story. All right, let's look at the lighter news today. The report, of course, is leading with the Western Province uh, rugby there. What are your views, Tandega, in terms of the front pages in comparison to other leading uh, newspapers? What is your take on the fact that, you know, they've decided to, uh, to be a front page with rugby news? Well, that's an interesting choice for a highly politicized society, but um, I am most attracted to the Pia Khalid because this is a story that is never ending. And I think it touches on the lives of most South Africans. The confidence with which we see our police force or the lack thereof, mm -hmm. and um, the perceived institutional rot in our police force is a, is a matter of concern to the broad mass of South Africans. And I think that... Um, we, we need to see some leadership and, and most definitely the depoliticization of our police force. All right. Thank you very much there. Let's look at very quickly. This is just a side story now. Sunday Times is leading with June Drops River no sex bombshell and apparently uh, river river's mother miss june Stienkamp has, has done a moving memoir where she explains how her daughter hasn't had in fact had sexual intercourse with mr pistorius what do you make of the story now Bumelel? I, I i must say i disagree with you it's not a a, a, a side story it's a very serious story that got serious implications mm. let me explain first the trial went and we had a verdict yes and then we had a sanction, right? These revelations were never brought to court. Now, the question now is, and, and you could see if they, at all they are true and they could somehow be substantiated, the question is, would they have had a material effect on the judgment 
on the, the whole entire case or on the, uh, the outcome thereof or the sanction that, or the penalty that has now been, been given. So if at all it is true, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I can safely say that it would, the lawyers would have interrogated it in court and the judge would have had an opportunity to say whether it would have a material impact in her judgment. So that's the first thing. The second problem that I have is that this story emanates from London which is one of the problems I've had with this, uh, some of these people who are involved in this case, that they signed these exclusive deals with international uh, uh, media companies. So you would want to interview them. They will tell you that, sorry, we're not talking to the South African media. All right. We're talking to the international media. All right, Bumelele. Which I think is also there. another problem. All right, Bumelele. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there because we're due for a very quick ad break now. And when we return, of course, did the inaugural midterm budget by Minister of Finance Ntlantlanene cater for all? Stay tuned for these and more answers. This is Media Monitor. Charge into a participating Dunlop zone for a power deal. Buy four 15-inch or larger Dunlop or Sumitama tires and get this free mobile power bank multi-charger. Charge it on the go or on your PC and stay powered up. Come in for a tire deal that will get you amps. Dunlop zone. Zoom into Africa. This is Tanzania. The president is Mr. Jakaya Kikwete. Tanzania got independent from United Kingdom on 9 December in 1961. The population is more than 47 million people. One of the major languages spoken is Swahili. Monetary unit is the Tanzanian shilling. It's ABC, sharing 20 years of inspiration. Welcome back to Media Monitor. Before we continue with the rest of the show, let's take Kondile from Mangawung on the line. Kondile, very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Your comment, please, sir. Uh, morning, Alicia, and to your guests. Morning, Kondile. Well, look, I, I wanted to, 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 to make an input on the strike of the post office that is protracted for some time now. Go ahead. For me, the, 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 it has got a long recent implications. For example, as much as I understand the labor issues that are there and uh, those people who have been uh, on the, uh, serving as casual for some time, but the implications also are, 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 are long recent. For example, if you can look at the level of municipalities where people are still banking on uh, accounts, manual accounts, uh, you know, so that they can pay their rates and taxes and so on. People cannot access that, and if you look at the status of other municipalities, you find that they don't have all these new technology where you can send uh, SMSs, where you can you can uh, get into e-billing system and so on. So that on its own causes an issue because what happens in a situation where people cannot be able to, 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 to pay and you don't have multiple of offices in different regions, uh, it then means that there's going to be issues with regard to the cash flow uh, within municipalities. So I'm saying it's two-way. It's labor, but also at the same time it's got ripple implications at the level of general governance. Mm, thank you so much. That's Kondile out in Mangawung giving us his, of course, his views on the strike by the post office. And of course, we will get to talk a little bit further on that topic as we continue with the show. Now, let's look at our next topic. Finance Minister Ntlantanene spared the poor in his midterm budget speech. He mentioned tax reforms will only be announced in February 2015. Let's take a look at this insert compiled by one of our producers, Musisi Wetong. In his maiden speech, Finance Minister Ntlantanene got the balance between the needs of the poor and the state. Let me be absolutely clear. We will not balance this budget on the backs of the poor. He also got tough on state-owned entities and civil servants. 
The country's embankment parastatals, including SAA and SA Post Office, will not be built out, but they will be restructured to make them financially viable. Following the successful restructuring of the Development Bank of Southern Africa, steps to address financial risks and improve governance are being undertaken uh, at uh, SAA, South African Express, the South African Post Office, and the Land Bank. He also mentioned cost containment measures on public service. Lower government consumption also requires prudent management of the public sector wage bill while maintaining the real value of public, public service salaries. New posts will also have to be funded from existing allocations and natural attrition. All right, now, panel, the minister's speech made serious waves in the news this week. Economists totally praised Minister Nene. Tandega, if you can just give us, in a nutshell, what did the minister's speech entail? Well, I think there are three key things that he did um, manage to do. Um, the first one, and I think the most important signal that he's giving to the market, is that he will um, spend less um, as we go along and people have begun to ask perhaps if this is the return of gear and um, the return of um, strict monetary policy and prudence and this is the most austere budget um, um, speech that we've had in a long time. You will remember that during the Praveen Gordon years um, the government sought to um, um, offer South Africa a stimulus package which involved um, through the parastatals and through the SOEs, spending our way out of crisis. Mm -hmm. And um, that perhaps um, saved us from the worst ravages of the economic meltdown. But perhaps now, because that um, had limited benefits, um, um, government is seeking now to scale back um, the amount of um, public spending. Mm -hmm. So. Um, He's Mr. Belt Tightening. Once again, we're back to, to the belt tightening years. And um, his stern words for many of the um, SOEs or the parastatals, um, indicating that um, firstly, he will consider other sources of funding, yes. um, like um, the possible partial privatization um, of um, some of the SOEs mm -hmm. and um, the sale of non-core um, SOEs and in order to, to raise capital to fund the existing SOEs like ESCOM. Mm -hmm. But he did bemoan the perilous and the endless crisis that is being experienced by the parastatals and said that none of them will get a bailout until they have put a credible business plan on the table. Mm. And the third thing is to indicate that the state will not take the pain alone and that the taxpayer come um, 2015 will get to hear in the February budget speech how much pain we are to take as, as, um, as taxpayers. But these are tight days indeed. Money is mm. too tight to mention. We're going to expand on that point as well. Now, Pumelelo, in terms of general coverage, has media summarized it well enough for the everyday man, or was it just a top business news story? Well, uh, I think that the coverage has been rather good. Um, I think it, it got decent coverage, but I think, unfortunately, the medium-term budget policy statement doesn't always get the kind of coverage that the annual budget gets. So for example, the February budget um, that uh, she says we're now waiting Why for. Why is that? Which is very unfortunate because um, the medium-term budget policy statement sets the government's priorities and expectations and all kinds of ideas over the next three periods. Mm -hmm. So all tiers of government and, and, and all those who depend on government for budgets and even the private sector, it looks at policy, it looks at tax policies, it looks at other things. Uh, they are able to plan over the, a, a three-year period. So I think we should do better in covering the budget policy statement instead of waiting for the budget of the year. So people can plan, so that ordinary people can also plan. Yes. Um, you already now can see that the minister says he wants to claw back $44 billion, uh, in taxes in the, ne in the next three years. Starting next year, he wants to get $15 billion out of our pockets. Mm. So people should already think, OK, does it mean that VAT is going to go up? Does Where it mean the that um, the pay as you earn is going to go up in your pay slip? You know, those kinds of things. Uh, is he going to tax the rich more? Uh, is he going to tax dividend, uh, dividend payouts? You know, those kinds of things. People should begin to plan and think about it.
but, but there are more fundamental problems with um, South African media coverage mm -hmm. of all budgets. And this budget was rather high profile because it was Minister Nene's debut and it was his maiden budget. However, um, South African media coverage tends to follow a very strict pattern um, and it chases indices rather than look at how it affects ordinary people. There's a, almost an obsession with economic indicators um, rather than um, a, a genuine concern for either the, the policy issues, the underlying moral issues, as well as um, how it affects ordinary people. And um, unfortunately, um, there's almost a herd mentality in the way we cover um, budgets. And it's mm. also very ideologically restricted. You know, um, there are these prescripts that are normally given by the IMF and the World Bank, and we only cover him in relation to whether he is going to meet and um, live up to these very narrow prescripts or not. And I think that's very unfortunate because it impoverishes economic and financial journalism because we tend not to look at other policy options and tend not to rigorously engage with the, the discipline of economics mm -hmm. as much as we should, ha should if we are to cover this um, economy as vigorously as we ought to. Mm. Very interesting views indeed. Now let's take some of your tweets and hear what some of our viewers are thinking in relation to this topic in particular. Mashako Makabuke says, as always, good speech from minister, but they fail on implementing. And of course, Mashako Makabuke is talking about the budget speech. Madlebongwe Manyonya says, yes, it is important for government to reduce its spending. Let's hope this time they will do as minister, as the minister said and of course Tandek, I just want to get back to you again tax charges are to be announced in, in February next year um, at the full budget speed but what's the purpose of tax increase and how will it affect the everyday man I think that's the question that we really want to ask of which media is not raising uh, Mpumelelo. I mean we've got a very narrow tax base in South Africa and um, very few people are paying tax and um, um, we would like to hear how he's going to propose that we address that issue. Um, but it means that for those people who are working and who are taxable, um, we are to pay more towards the, um, the coffers of the state. But as we look at tax, Alicia, we must also look at a very negative um, phenomenon creeping into our economic behavior as a people, mm -hmm. and that is rent-seeking behavior. It's like the famous singer Donna Summer said, often when you look at state interventions, you wonder if nothing is going on here but the rent. Mm. Rent-seeking behavior is that behavior which is parasitic and it adds no new value to, 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 to the All economy. Right. It All just right. simply seeks to, um, to, 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 to sponge off already existing value. So we need to Mm. try and find a way in which we, we really grow this economy in new and novel ways. Thank you so much. Uh, that's our SABC business editor, Ms. Tandega Kubula, joining us to talk to us about, in a bit more detail, of course, about Minister Nene's uh, midterm budget speech. Now we're going to take a very quick ad break. And after the break, it's our one-on-one -on -one segment with the president of COSATU, Mr. Sidomo Lamini. You don't want to miss this. Stay tuned. This is SABC News. reopening an Ebola clinic in its remote southeast in an effort to prevent sick nationals seeking better treatment elsewhere. The new labor law also seeks to clamp down on violent strikes by holding a trade union liable for violence committed by its members during a strike. The new canal is set to boost annual revenues to about $13 billion by 2023. It's part of a larger project to expand port and shipping facilities around the canal. This is Vigigas's fourth victory on the PGA Tour. That's all the weather that I have for you for now. Stay tuned. For all your business news, catch news at 1 every day. Be informed.
Welcome back to Media Monitor. The future of NUMSA still hangs in the balance while Kosato is yet to make a decision about its future in the Federation. To help us delve further into this issue, we are proud to be joined in studio by the President of Kosato, the Honorable Mr. Stubo Lamini. Mr. Lamini, thank you so much for making time to be with us on the show today. Thank you very much, my sister. Good morning to you and the viewers out there. All right. Mr. Lamini, now you've just had a, a CEC meeting. And uh, are you able to briefly tell us First, before we go into the outcome of that CEC meeting, basically the reasonings that led to the possible expulsion of NUMSA from the Federation, Kosatu. Well, <coughs> we convened this uh, meeting uh, as per the decision of the Central Executive Committee of the 8th of uh, April 2014, mm -hmm. when the ANC came in to say they are intervening uh, and we are agreed to that as the federation we put matters in abeyance to allow for the process of the intervention by the anc mm -hmm. there were about nine uh, items on the agenda it was numsa to answer to the question as to why they cannot be expelled or suspended from the federation for violating the constitution of the federation by expanding their scope to interfere with the scope of other COSAT unions, which is a challenge that has led to a, a, a huge, huge uh, a state of uh, a, a tensions in the federation. Mm -hmm. There were other matters, the status of the second deputy president. Uh, I was also expected in that meeting to give a report on the requested special national congress mm -hmm. there were matters that were to do with the issues relating to our general secretary and there were litigation matters so 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 it's a linear of items that have been put in abeyance since then when the anc concluded its uh, work uh, it is expected that uh, they needed to come and give their report mm -hmm. on how they have done. That's why we convened the meeting of the 21st to the 23rd of October okay. uh, this past week. All right. Uh, you you talking about the matter of uh, uh, the expulsion of NUMSA or possible expulsion of NUMSA. Our m meeting had two agenda items mm -hmm. is the first one to listen to the report of the ANC and then discuss these matters that have been put in abeyance mm -hmm. but we are also to listen to the uh, 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 preparatory work on the central committee that is coming we had this meeting and I'm sure uh, uh, you would want to know what was happening yes, in, in that meeting. Yes, please, we're dying to know what happened in the <laughs> It's a meeting, meeting of the leadership of the Federation, the mm. highest in this country, uh, uh, where we were meeting to look into those matters. Mm. Obviously, the ANC did come and give its report, which was accepted by the uh, Central Executive Committee. And uh, we are still discussing that report. Mm -hmm. Actually, we are on item two of that report. Okay. Uh, 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 in spite of what uh, you media people are saying, <laughs> uh, we're discussing the expulsion, <laughs> we're discussing. We, we, are, we are busy with that report because we must use that report to guide us to handle these difficult issues. We could not conclude. We then have had to uh, decide because the three days ended without the agenda being finished. We have set yet another date, which is the 7th <clears throat> of November, to uh, have these further discussions. The agenda that I've just outlined yes. is in the meeting of that particular meeting of the 7th. Very interesting. Now, Mr. Lamine, I want to know, in terms of your Tripartite Alliance partners and affiliates, are they in any position to influence your decision in this matter? Yes, they can influence the Central Executive Committee's decision on this matter. What they cannot do, they cannot decide for COSATU what COSATU must do, which mm -hmm. is what uh, I think has uh, caught you, the media, uh, 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 in, in mistakes of believing that the ANC will instruct or has instructed COSATU uh, not to expel or to expel. The ANC can't instruct COSATU to expel or not to expel NUMSA. The ANC, uh, as it has done in this instance, 
emphasizes the importance of the unity of the federation, mm -hmm. and we all are together in that one. Mm -hmm. The ANC cannot prescribe what COSATU must do. It is the executive committee of COSATU that will make the decisions. Mm. Mr. Lamini, now let's say NUMSA is expelled. Would it have any specific impact on the federation itself? Most definitely it would. Uh, not because NUMSA is a, 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 a biggest affiliate of COSATU, but because NUMSA, like any other affiliate of COSATU, is very, very important in the federation. Uh, if we lose one of us, we are weaker than yes. we, 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 we were uh, uh, yesterday. So it's not a matter that we're looking at uh, quite uh, lightly. As you can imagine, uh, it's not a decision you have to rush to take. Mm. You must make sure that you try your best to persuade one another. We must give NUMSA an opportunity to explain properly why they cannot be suspended or expelled. All right. Before I let you go, Mr. Zamini, there are some tweets, of course, that have come through on this discussion. Let's see if we can see those tweets. There, Mazwai Volkega says, expelling NUMSA from the Federation would be expelling ANC votes. Thank you so much to Mazwai Volkega for your comment there. Malibongo Manyonya says, Kosatu is more focused on fighting with government on ETO issues uh, are forgotten, and they've also forgotten about workers, rather. Is this true? Do you it think, is Mrs. definitely Zamini? not true. You know, uh, uh, the, the advantage of the media, it's the only window where people of South Africa can think and see what is happening. Mm -hmm. But in reality, something else will be happening. COSATU is busy solving those issues affecting workers because it is our unions on a daily basis. Our strength as COSATU is the strength of our affiliates, our weakness is the weakness of affiliates. Mr. Lamini, thank you so much for your I time you. right here on Media Monitor. All right, well, that's the president of COSATU, Mr. Stumo Lamini, talking to us about the COSATU Nomsa saga. And of course, you've heard it from the horse himself. We will be hearing more details as the story unfolds, but we're going to take a very quick ad break now. And when we return... We are demonstrating to this company to say we are still on strike because of our demands have been yet met. All right, we're going to take a very quick ad break. We'll be back with that and more. Stay tuned. This is Media Monitor. Higher Education and Training Minister Bladen Zimande has conceded that the bursary scheme is not enough to meet the growing demand from students. Funding for universities is not enough. We have to be open about that. We will continue to ask for more from government as a department. We've always said that the NASFAS budget must be 16 billion rand and that uh, no qualifying student must be prevented from studying just because they cannot afford to do so. There's been concern about citrus exports to Europe and investment contracts. There are more opportunities for us to sell sugar, wine, ethanol, some fruit products than we had before and that uh, that could create jobs. That's business news, weekdays at 6 p.m. on SABC News. Welcome back to Media Monitor. Post office employees are still on strike, demanding a 15% salary hike, while casual staff is demanding permanent employment. The strike has now entered its third month. Let's take a quick look at this insert compiled by one of our producers, Malibu Homakut. A three-month-long strike has left many post office employees in destitute. Each and every morning when I, I wake up in the morning, my wife asks me where I go. I say I'm going to work. But unfortunately, at the end of the month, like this month, 
I don't, I don't think I'm going to be paid. The most affected are the families, education institutions, and business sectors. I had to use um, the study material provided from my UNISA. Police were on a lookout as tensions remained high between striking and non-striking workers this week, but no settlement has been reached. All right, we are now joined by the Caxton Professor of Journalism and Media Studies and Director of Journalism Program at the University of the Witwatersrand, Professor Anton Haber. Professor, very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right, Professor, let's start with you. Has the media come even close to properly covering the so many different angles of this post office strike? I'm surprised there hasn't been more coverage. I'm surprised that um, as a reader, I don't understand more what this long and difficult strike is about. Um, so I must say I haven't been that impressed by the coverage. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that part of the problem is that the strike started as a sporadic kind of thing. I mean, here in, at, in the Johannesburg area and some other parts of the country, it sort of grew uh, gradually to become a national strike. So it wasn't like this before. That's why many people perhaps may not understand the details. So, as it was starting at a sporadic, you know, at the local level, mm -hmm. we were covering it, um, but it was not making the front page headline. So we were covering it as a business story, as a labor story, as a social story of people uh, not getting their parcels and stuff like that. And then as it grew, it's now becoming a national uh, big story. And I think it's going to get more coverage now in the light of the Minister of Finance's sp uh, speech in Parliament where he said that the post office is one of those SOEs uh, that need to be looked at in terms of... Uh, turn around and, and things like that. Professor, would the view that because uh, the strike mostly affects the poor people, that's why it hasn't made such huge, uh, major news uh, throughout the time, uh, from right at uh, the beginning of the strike? I'm not sure. I think, I think uh, this, uh, a long, difficult strike like that um, affects everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, being the post office, it affects our economy in many different ways. And there are a lot of important things that need to go on that don't go on um, if the post office isn't working. Um, I think it's right. I think that um, I, I'm not sure it's because uh, it affects poor people more. I think it's because of the way the strike unfolded. Um, I think it's because there's been a lot of big news competing for, for space on our front pages. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a lot also depends on how um, open and articulate um, the various parties are, such as the trade unions involved. Mm. Let's talk about in comparison to the AMCO strike, for example, in Pumelelo. Yeah. Uh, it received much, much coverage, a little uh, right in the beginning, and then the coverage started dwindling. And then obviously at the end, when big stakeholders started taking notice, that's when it came back in the news. Well, I'm, I'm not sure whether we'll be comparing uh, things properly here, because uh, the, the, the AMCO strike uh, inevitably had to get a lot of coverage. I mean, uh, the, the economic contribution, but the, the contribution of mining the same, in the economy. Lelo, the same, it's the same effects no, to I, the people. Yes, I know. But mm -hmm. there was also that AMCO strike also was very violent. And there was not just a strike uh, against the, the mine owners, but it was also um, union rivalry, which also contributed to the killings in Marikana. So the AMCO strike was a little bit much more complex and, 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 and had serious, much more serious implications than the post office. I'm not saying that the significance of the post office strike shouldn't be, you know, uh, shouldn't be looked at. I was about but I'm, to uh, ask if you say that I don't it only that. makes news if it's, you know, there's <laughs> violence and all sorts of bloody things going on. Yeah, but I'm, I don't agree also that the strike in the post office is getting less coverage because it involves poor people. Actually, the, if you look at the role of the post office, I mean, there are many corporates, big companies, who actually depend um, uh, uh, on the post office. I personally also depend on the post office. I order books from all over the world, and now they are stuck somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but what it will do, inevitably, it, it, the post office will be, uh, will be at a loss in the end because people are going to start to shift from other, to other modes of receiving their goods and, and, and services. They're going to shift to... Uh, digital, they're going to shift to, and they're going to give away the market share that, you know, was already dwindling to private operators who can do the postal services. Already and there was a report I think about part of the, the alternative coverage, yeah. means of actually getting your books that you so highly require. There's already been uh, alternative means that people are actually now using. Uh, Professor, do you want yeah. to add something there? I do want to say that, you know, previously in this country, certainly in the in 1980s, 
and being the labor reporter or labor editor was a major job on every newspaper. That was downgraded post-1994, partly because of what was happening, um, both in the newsrooms and in the economy as a whole. Um, um, and I think that was one of the reasons um, we kind of woke up late to the significance of the AMCU strike. Mm. Um, and I think that newspapers are going to have to relook at the way, the scope, the nature of their labor coverage, because it's no longer mainly a political story. It's back to being a core labor story. Absolutely. Now, uh, Pumalelo, has the media really covered the general effects on people uh, by the strike? I don't think there's been the, the coverage has been there, but I don't think it's sufficient. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think we can do better uh, in that regard, and I think uh, the prof is correct that over time the the labor desks in the newspapers have sort of not been elevated as they were before. I mean, take the SAPC for example; it used to have a, a labor editor uh, um, who used to go out in the field and and report directly on what was happening. You hardly see that in, uh, in, in the newspapers as well. The labor desks have sort of been downgraded. But I know of moves in other media groups where that is now being brought back, especially following the AMCO, AMCO strike. Mm. Um, I think people can now realize that uh, it's something that you can no, no longer take for granted or relegate to other uh, inside pages. It's mm. a top story in South Africa. It's part of the broader economic climate. It's part of reporting about workers, the poor. Um, that's why even COSATU, for example, is getting so much uh, coverage precisely because people can realize that mm. whatever happens in Corsat has a bearing on ordinary people. Let's see what people, ordinary people, think. Um, Pumelelo. Let's take our tweets now. Charlize Newson says, "Disaster for the post office. Assured users a change to alternative means. Plus, we'll never use the post office again. Spite themselves." Thank you so much, uh, Carlise, uh, for your comment there. Zama says, "It has costed us. It has cost us a lot. Some of us used to renew our car license disc at the post office. Now we have to queue at the traffic department." All right. Thank you so much. Uh, to our loyal viewers there for your input. Let's see if we have more. See, viewer says it's very stressful to us people who want to make applications. We can't even post our applications. All right, I suppose the viewer is one of the students mostly affected by the strike. And of course, Zama says it has costed us a lot. Yes, we've gone through that one. Thank you so much to everybody at home for, of course, your input there. Let's take Wilton in Auckland Park. Wilton, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Your comment, please. Uh, good morning. Good morning uh, I belong to the Metal Industries Pension Fund, and I have to, every year, because of my age, uh, send them a certificate of existence, uh, which I have sent twice uh, since August. Uh, but last Friday, when my pension was due and it didn't arrive, I phoned them and they said, because of the, pension uh, because of the postal strike, uh, they have not received my certificate of existence. Therefore, I'm no longer receiving a pension mm, mm, very from them. Now, this pension uh, covers my rent, my medical aid, uh, my telephone account, and without that, I cannot pay. Mm. Wilton, thank you so much for your input on the show. Mpumelel, very quickly, what are your views on this now? Well, obviously, this is a serious matter now. I think that... Um, all those people who are providing services to the poor, to the disadvantaged through the post office, I think it's also incumbent upon them to come out and tell the public how much they are putting it out there, which is not reaching the intended uh, beneficiaries. It's stuck somewhere. There are also now risks of people's goods being stolen now because, you know, already somewhere there must be an overflow in the warehouse mm. of things not being picked up. All right, Pumale, uh, So we, those are some of the things that going forward we will have to cover. All right, thank you very much. Let's hopefully, hopefully we'll see some of the stories and angles coming out this week. All right, let's move on to our next story. Now, North Korea is the first country to close its borders in fear of the deadly Ebola virus to foreign travelers. While in the U.S., the fourth person to be diagnosed with Ebola is being treated at an isolation unit at a New York hospital. In Africa, the World Health Organization has officially declared that there are no new cases of Ebola in both Nigeria as well as Senegal. Now, panel, once again, Ebola has been topping world news. Obama was hugging the Australian nurse that actually made it uh, through. Has the media looked at this other side of Ebola, the recovery side, Professor? Well, I want to say that I was in the U.S. last week, so I saw the coverage roll out um, uh, as, as the U.S. was hit by, by its first cases. And what was striking w was how they went 
not just the quantity of coverage, suddenly it became a, from, from a big story to a huge story, um, but suddenly there were real people. It struck me that when it was covered in West Africa, we were talking about numbers, numbers. and quantities um, and diseases, but when it came to America, suddenly it was real people. Um, and I think there are real dangers and real risks in how one covers um, issues like this. And I certainly see that a lot of the media around the world has fallen into those traps. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, Pumelelo, your views? Well, I think my views that I think this is one issue that has actually received the coverage that it deserves all over the world. Um, because I think there's a realization in the media that this is not just an isolated case or something like that. I think everybody realizes that there's a global security risk at play here and uh, affecting people's ability to travel. You know, um, this thing is so contentious. I mean, uh, uh, no, no, no time in the, in the history of humanity that we have had in, uh, something as contentious as, as this one. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, some time ago the UN declared uh, HIV AIDS as a, a global security risk, but as more innovation in drugs became available to deal with it to mitigate the impact, I think it sort of subsided. Now we're having this uh, case. I think it, it, it's, it's, it's actually getting the deserved a coverage all over the world. And I think South Africans are able, South African media is able to pick up stories through the uh, news agencies, uh, global news agencies about what's happening in the US, and then we're able to inform people here about what's going on up there. Mm. Professor, I just want to find out from you now, the African leaders were condemned for their slow response also to help their neighbors. Has our media raised these questions, especially you just came back from the US. Did you see a likeness in terms of coverage? with our local and international media? Um, no, and I think that is an issue we will have to look at over time. Uh, because the root of this problem is, uh, is uh, the response, the quality of uh, the health systems um, in these countries. I mean, the US has shown that if, that if you act and you have the means, you can contain it. Mm. Um, uh, so there are real questions to be asked about that, that hopefully will be the questions we ask over time. All right. And then, Pumelelo, isn't it time media gave us a daily fact file on the virus, how it spreads, and how to be cautious? Come on. I think that's a good idea. Remember <laughs> what that, are you uh, going to do about it? <laughs> remember that the uh, newspapers work on the basis of, like the whole media, work on the basis of discussions. You are the editors. Uh, so you listen to what people say and where the mood is going, and you try to pick up you know, things that could be helpful. Um, I think the, 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 the Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Aaron Mutualedi, has tried to do something like that, and the media has gone along with that, where he gives regular briefs about what's happening, how South Africa stands, the capabilities that we have to deal with it in the borders, um, and, and the, the, the facilities available in hospitals. So there is in the media some kind of a brief, but it tends to follow what the Minister of Health says or what's happening uh, out there. But of course, the media covers what's happening. It covers what people are saying, what the authorities, whether the authorities are ready. Right. So I think, I think uh, um, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting one. And I think the Minister of Health is already doing that. All right. Well, we hopefully we'll see more coverage and follow up on that story. We're going to take our final break. And after the break, the panel will tell us what they think will be making news headlines this coming week. Don't go anywhere. This is Media Monitor. And we heard from Monday, the 6th of October, your world moves from 11 to 12 p.m. to an earlier time, 9 to 10 p.m. And it comes to you live Monday till Friday. We are SABC News. This former bread basket of Africa playing host to SADC leaders. I feel humbled and yet greatly honored at being appointed the chairman of SADC. When I was a student, Harvard was only my visible college, my formal classes, but I was also a student in, in an invisible college. The outbreak in West Africa is the world's deadliest to date. It's centered on Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, with cases also reported in Nigeria. Catch news at 8, 7 days a week. Be informed.
Welcome back to our final segment, which is where I get to ask my panel what stories they think will be making you as headlines throughout this week. Let's start with you, Professor. Well, it's always difficult to predict. <laughs> um, but I think we, we, we hopefully will learn more about Kasatu and where it's headed and where NUMS is headed. Um, there is a story on the edge that intrigues me that I hope uh, becomes clearer. I don't know if it will make the lead, but hopefully it will make the front page, which is the battles in HCI, the attempts to push out Marcel Golding, it appears. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fascinating story. Um, and hopefully we'll uh, hopefully these stories we see unfold now, we'll learn more about Absolutely, this week. Absolutely, a follow-up. There yeah. we go. Bumelelo, what well, should we expect the, the, this week? There's a lot of stories, uh, uh, I think, but it's just difficult to You're say which one for choice. The top. But I think the Kosatu <laughs> story will be interesting about what now. You heard as to Mutlamini earlier saying that they need uh, uh, um, uh, 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 all the unions to be together. They don't want any breakaway. But at the same time now, um, Numsa must explain to Kosatu why it shouldn't be expelled. So that, I think, would be a big story. Mm -hmm. The post of story is ongoing. But there's another story. I, I, I'm not sure whether we will hear the appeal uh, this, this coming week uh, of uh, the SAPC COO, Shawudu uh, Mutsunueng, whether what would be his argument in appealing against the, the, the court verdict that said he should be suspended. I think it's a big story because it has got certain jurisprudential uh, significance right. insofar as the powers of the public protector are concerned. All right, your one minute is up. That's Mpumelelo joining us uh, for the first time right here on Media Monitor. And of course, I'd, I'd like to thank my guest and the professor, Professor Anton Harbour, joining us all the way from uh, the University of Advantage Rans. Our viewers' contributions and suggestions are highly valued. You can follow us on Twitter at SA Media Monitor and share your views and comments on Facebook. Go to www.facebook.com forward slash Media Monitor and like our page. You can also email us your views about the show. Media Monitor at sabc.co.za. Thank you so much for watching Media Monitor. Do join us again next week right here on the SABC 24-hour news channel. And just in case you missed our live show, remember you can still catch the repeat tomorrow morning at 2 a.m. or go to our SABC YouTube link on www.youtube.com forward slash SABC News. For myself, Alicia Jolly, and the rest of the QTIV team, have yourself a blessed Sunday. Goodbye.